So I kind of went through a couple of iterations of what I was going to say up here. I'm just going to go ahead and be like candid and honest about that. Uh, the, the, the tenor of my presentation sort of changed because of some things that have happened in my life the last few months. And, and when I was approached to speak, uh, when, when, when Charles and Joe were nice enough to ask me to speak, and, I, and I'm honored to be here, I think that the idea was that because I've worked in the Apple ecosystem, uh, excuse me, in the uh, technology ecosystem for so long, and I've written about apps and, 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 and the App Store since its inception, and um, that I could kind of give like a, a state of, of what's happening um, in that world. And I will. We'll get there. Uh, but first, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out with uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of a detour, but it'll make sense, I promise. So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a technology journalist. Um, until uh, about a month ago, I was at a company called Mashable. I now work for Gizmodo. This is the t part of the talk where I now uh, exclaim that the opinions expressed here do not necessarily represent those of Univision, <laughs> Fusion, or the Gizmodo Media Group. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I know I do not habla espanol, but I do work for, uh, technically, I, I now work for Univision, which uh, is weird. Um, I am, I'm a podcaster. Uh, uh, Stephen Hackett, who is in the audience, um, co-owner of the great Relay FM. Um, I have a podcast on Relay called Rocket, and I do a couple of other podcasts, too. Uh, I'm an occasional pundit, and what this basically means is that I'll like, go on TV to explain like, why the world is ending or isn't ending as regards to technology. World ending, like the, the phone's blowing up, right? Like if, if your phone is blowing up, like that's like world ending. World not ending is like, you know, iMessage being kind of terrible. Um, slash great. It's chaotic, but it's kind of a mess. Um, and I'm not a risk taker, usually. Um, but in the last couple of months, as I'm kind of going to get into, I've had to take, reassess my career and reassess my life and think about taking risks. And I think that even though I'm a journalist and I'm not an app developer, there's actually a lot of things in common between working in media and working as an, as an indie app developer. Um, in some ways, it's because what uh, we do can be kind of unstable at times. Uh, the media world is kind of famous for, you know, you are oftentimes building on other people's platforms and you're reliant on what rules Facebook or Google or anybody else makes and, and, and changes. And if they change their algorithm, um, you know, Facebook changes their news algorithm, then like your pages might not be by, but not be read by as many people, which means that you don't sell as many ads, which means that you don't make as much money, which means you might not have a job. And that's not dissimilar from working in an app ecosystem where what you do is really dependent on what Google or Apple or Microsoft or anyone else says you can and cannot do. And so I've been thinking a lot about kind of risk in the last couple of months, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about why. Um, this is a brief diversion, and I do have a point, I promise. So my joke has uh, been, uh, for the last couple of months, and some people will get this, if you like Nick Jonas, you will. Uh, this album's great, by the way. Uh, so the last summer was, as we might say, complicated. So let's, uh, let's rewind back to April, like first week of April. I'm at Mashable, I've been there for seven years, and Everything seems okay, right? Like, uh, I'm a little bit bored at work. I, I write about technology. I'm our chief uh, senior tech correspondent, whatever the hell that means. And um, I'd just been coming off of the Apple versus FBI story, and I was actually really starting to enjoy my job, again, for the first time in a long time. But I was a little bored. Things work-wise seemed fine. You know, I'd been at this company, and just for some perspective, when I joined Mashable, it had nine people, and we all worked remotely, and there were no offices. And the CEO still worked on the weekends to get content on the site because if he didn't, then we wouldn't have content on the weekends. He didn't want the staff to have to do that. Um, by April of 2016, there were more than 300 people in the company. And so over a seven-year period, I was able to watch a small media company build up and grow. And that's an interesting thing to kind of see as a reporter. And also, I think, just as kind of an... In that's just, it's interesting to watch. It's interesting to kind of cover an industry and see kind of from the inside what it's like when a very small kind of niche business becomes something larger. And so everything seemed okay. You know, um, Mashable is not the biggest tech site out there, although they definitely have traffic and people, most people know who they are, not, not, not everybody. Um, but in the, the pantheon of, you know, media companies and, and, and spaces, which is the business that I'm in, you know, they weren't, you know, Vox, uh, you know, which, which has The Verge, and, and they weren't, you know, Vice or, or BuzzFeed, but it was still well known. And, and in fact, a week before everything changed, um, announced that they, uh, you know, the company had taken on an additional $15 million in funding. And everything seemed like it was okay. It seemed like everything was going well. It seemed like the business was in a good place. You know, I felt like, well, 
at least we closed this round. I, I'd heard, you know, rumblings of the, that the company had been trying to sell potentially, and, and I knew that they'd been struggling for a long time to close the round. And, and, and secretly, I was kind of even thinking to myself, you know, $15 million, not to discount that, but that's not a huge amount of money, especially when you see that Business Insider sold for, you know, like $276 million to some German company, and, and, and Vice and, and, and BuzzFeed have raised, you know, and Box have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and and, and you know, you're competing not just against those companies, but also against traditional players like Univision. Again, um, I don't speak for my employer. Uh, Disney and, um, and it's CNN and, and, and those sorts of things. Um, but it seemed like everything was okay. It seemed like the business was fine. You know, they got this investment and they kept saying, you know, this is going to be kind of the future of our company. But it turns out that it wasn't okay. And uh, Nashville ended up laying off 10% of its staff the, the, the first like I think it was April 7th of, uh, oh, yeah, April 7th, 2016. Um, my job was safe. And I was told that as long as the company existed that I would have a job. But I had to realize that a lot of my colleagues and friends no longer worked there. That the vision of the company was shifting. And that everything that I thought that I'd known and that I'd helped build for seven years was changing. And so my first thought on that was, you know, fear. And you're afraid, right? Because when something changes, and I think that, that as, as indies, you guys can kind of probably relate to this, it's scary because you think that everything's okay, you think that you have time, and then all of a sudden the script is flipped and you're afraid. And I'm afraid and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? And what do I need to do next? And then the next thing is I feel guilty because I still have a job and who the hell am I to be scared when other people that I know and that I love many of whom are more talented than me, many of whom were paid less than me, don't have a job. And I'm feeling guilt. Like, why am, am I allowed to still be okay when everything else around me is, is seemingly falling apart? And then that left to kind of a period of uncertainty. And I very quickly, you know, realized I'd been thinking about leaving the company for a while anyway. I'd, I'd, I'd kind of gone back and forth and, and, and fear, actually, had kind of kept me from making that decision. I, as I said before, I'm not a risk taker most of the time. My father is an entrepreneur, and I, I grew up the daughter of an entrepreneur and kind of got to see the downsides of when sometimes, you know, that can lead to everything always worked out, but it can sometimes be stressful. And so I've always wanted to kind of, you know, focus on the sure thing as much as it can be. And I know that's funny. I work in media, so, you know, sure thing, whatever. But, 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 but for, for me, you know, seven years was, was a good run, and, and, and it seemed like it was okay. But now I'm suddenly uncertain, and I'm uncertain about what I want to do and, and, and how I feel about the place that I'm at, because now things are, are, are different, and I have no control. And that was probably the scariest part. And so I, I started talking to different people and, and, and talking to other companies, and, and I talked to some places, um, some big, and, and probably would have paid me a lot of money, which in retrospect, maybe I should have taken, but I would have been bored, right? I would have been bored out of my mind. And then there were some places where, you know, the offer was very good. There was a place I talked to that had a, a, gave me a really nice offer. It wasn't quite as much money as, as what I, I was making, but it was close enough that, that with taxes it probably would have been the same. Um, but there were a few red flags that ended up being very pressing. I'm very glad that, that, I, that I made the decision I made. And where I said, you know, I don't, I don't think this is right. I might be ready to move on, but I don't want to make a decision based on fear. And I have to say that in uncertainty with your business, when things are unclear, that was the single-handed best thing that I, I could have possibly done, which was to not make a life-changing decision based on fear. Because if I had, as I'll kind of get to the, later on, it, it, would have been, it, it wouldn't have been okay. The, the title of my presentation is, it's fine. And it probably wouldn't have been. So going with my gut and saying, don't make this decision based on fear was a really good thing. But then again, you know, you have to think, well, what's next? And so I almost took this job, a very nice offer uh, from a company that, you know, I thought was going to be doing okay. And I, I didn't because I didn't feel like, it, it just didn't feel right. And, and taking a risk as much as that I, I do now believe they're necessary, it just didn't feel right at that time. But at that point I knew you're ready to move on. You're ready to accept other offers. The next time something good comes along, take it. And that was actually a really big step for me because being at a company for seven years, I'd, I'd had people approach me before. And I'd had good offers before that I'd turned down or things that I hadn't followed up on, people I'd ghosted, conversations I didn't pick up on. 
And in retrospect, some of those things were maybe mistakes, you know? But I think we've all been in those situations where you feel like you have an opportunity and you're afraid to take that risk and you're afraid to jump in and do it. And what this experience kind of taught me was, you know, even though I'm lucky, even though I feel guilty that I'm relatively okay, but I see how the company that I'm with is different. I see that the environment that I'm in is different. Um, I now know that I'm ready to do something else and I'm ready to take a risk. And risks are necessary. So I took what I would say is a pretty big risk. Um, I was reached out to by the, the, the company now known as Gizmodo Media Group, formerly known as Gawker Media Group, um, on a Thursday. And they came at me and they said, we have this offer for a, a writing gig. And we want you to be, the, the, the job title was basically to be the voice of Gizmodo. So the person who would kind of be the, the you know, write the, the hot takes and, and kind of be the definitive voice for you know, kind of their opinions and analysis. And, and the job wasn't demonstrably different from what I was already doing, but it would have been for a bigger audience and for a different audience. I was like, okay, well, that's intriguing. Sure, I'll, I'll take that. The next day, uh, Gawker filed for bankruptcy. And so I'm like, well, shit. You know, this sounded like it was a good idea, but there's no way I'm going to take this job. There's no way I'm going to go work for a company that's in the middle of a bankruptcy sale. And, and, and doubling back for a second, you know, all the, the turmoil and the things that I went through, you know, at Mashable, gosh, that was nothing compared to what the people in the same building, that's, that's a funny aside, uh, Gawker and Mashable are in the exact same building, um, went through and, and, and the things that they've gone through through their legal issues over the past you know, few years. Um, and so I, I kept the interview mostly because I thought it'd be a great story. I was like, well, I'm never going to take this job. <laughs> but how funny would it be to be able to tell a story about how I interviewed at Gawker a week after they filed for bankruptcy, right? Like, it, it, I'm a storyteller by nature. I figured oh, that'd, be, that'd be a cool job. Um, that'd be a cool story. That'd be fun. Um, and then I went into the interview. And I really liked the people. And I really liked the idea. And I started thinking, well, damn, you know, this is the perfect job if only the company wasn't so screwed. And then I went in for a second interview, and then a third, and then a fourth. And that I'm being reassured, you know, even if Gawker.com doesn't survive, you know, Gizmodo is kind of the crown jewel. It's where most of the traffic comes from. It'll be fine. And, you know, the, the, the president and, and, and chief counsel can't guarantee me that I'm not going to accept a job and then it's going to disappear in two days. But, you know, they're saying, look, we're not going to hire anybody if we think that's going to happen. And, you know, I just turned down a couple of jobs that seemed really stable. And... I, I didn't even tell my mom that I was going to take this job because I couldn't even explain to her. Hey, mom, I'm, I'm quitting my, my job of seven years uh, to go join a company that uh, is going to be sold probably the week before I join. And I don't know who's going to own it. And I don't know what's going to happen. That's either really dumb or really, you know, uh, a big risk. Um, but I, I, I took the risk. And, um, you know, so far it's paid off. Uh, Univision, again, I don't speak for them. Uh, ended up uh, buying the company. Um, they promised to give us resources. And so far, uh, one, um, there was a whole thing where we almost went on strike. But that aside, <laughs> it's been fine. And, and that's sort of been kind of my, my philosophy for the last five months or so, is that it will be fine, probably. And no matter what happens in your business and in your life, if you have a goal, and if you know what you're doing, and if you are committed to what you're building, taking risks, the worst thing that can happen, maybe it doesn't work out, and that's okay, but it will be fine, probably. All right, so um, back to apps, which is the whole reason we're here, but thank you for indulging that aside of mine. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk about, and I, again, I think this sort of melts because Again, you know, I'm, I work in media, which is a very uneven industry, and the app ecosystem right now is not the st most steady, especially with things, people who rely on the app store. If you do contract work, maybe it's a little bit different, but if you're building your own app company and you're selling apps directly to, to users, it's um, the, the, the halcyon days of, of 2008, 2009, 2010 are over. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of, you know, how I see, you know, the state of the app store. You know, Paid apps are still on life support. I think everybody in this room knows that. That's actually uh, the post that, that, that I wrote about that, that mentioned, uh, that, that quoted Joe, is I wrote a, st a story from Mashable almost three years ago. It was in October of 2013 called, Paid Apps Aren't Dead, But They Are on Life Support. And three years later, everything I wrote there has come true times 10. You know, selling apps from, with a direct sales model 
is more difficult than ever before because as consumers, we've become conditioned not to want to pay for them. Um, people have been burned when they bought things before that don't work. And there's not systems in place like free trials <laughs> that can help build pe bring people into that ecosystem. Um, other things that are happening, you know, last year, at, uh, at the iPhone 6S event, um, Apple famously kind of launched or relaunched a bunch of platforms. They launched, you know, WatchOS, which they'd already announced, you know, WWDC, TVOS, and in the iPad Pro. And the whole idea was, I think, a lot of people, including Apple, um, a lot of developers probably in this room all thought, well, you know, this will be that app boom that we were, that we haven't had for a while. And everybody's gonna flock to these platforms and these platforms are gonna take off and they're gonna be sales out the wazoo or you know, watch OS apps and, and, and you know, or iPhone apps that have watch OS components and for tvOS apps. Um, let me just find out, I guess, from the audience, like how many of you have a watch OS or a tvOS app? Okay, so a handful. And keep your hand up if, if they performed to your expectations in the app store. Okay, one guy, it's two, two, two guys, okay. So, so I, I think that that says where this is at, right? Is that even the, these platforms are out and they require an investment and the investment so far hasn't really paid off, at least for developers that I've talked to and I know for some of you in this room. And, and for those that it has, that's awesome. Um, but the fact is that apps just, you know, these platforms haven't been as successful as uh, we might have hoped. And that's primarily because we're now in a very mature ecosystem. And, and a lot of people have written this and said this, but it's worth repeating. And I, I see this all the time when I'm pitched apps and people want me to write about apps and I have to explain, yeah, I'm not gonna write about your app. Your app is awesome, but I can't write one-off stories about apps because people just don't, don't care enough. And that's partially because we're in this mature ecosystem where the growth days are kind of over. And that's because smartphones, everyone has one. And we're now in America on our you know, fourth or fifth smartphone, even for regular people. And, and for other parts of the world where you know, these things are emerging, you know, um, Apple's not as big um, at, in, in other parts of the world. And even where it is, you know, um, the app ecosystem there is different and it's mature. And so those, those growth there that we saw you know, five years ago in the first few years of the App Store, that's, 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 kind, of, that's kind of over. And, um, and so you know, developers and, and users and everybody else has to kind of realign themselves accordingly. And I know you guys all know that. Um, app fatigue is a real thing. Uh, one of the you know, studies have shown, you know, App Annie's done reports on this, there have been other reports too, that show the amounts of apps that users are downloading are less. People download fewer apps now than they were a few years ago, and they're using fewer apps than they were a few years ago. Because app fatigue is a real thing. You know, it was great when there was an app for everything. You know, there's an app for that was a great slogan. That was an awesome thing. Uh, but it gets to the point where you didn't want to have to always open up a different app for different things. And so instead, you actually kind of see this opposite, where you have these catch-all apps that do everything. And, and that's where, you know, WeChat's in China from Tencent, and, and Facebook Messenger in the United States, and even some of the Google apps, you know, really start to kind of take off because they can do lots of things. Because why should I have to, if I want to order a car while I'm talking to people, I don't want to have to leave my conversation to order my car. I don't want to have to use you know, a separate calendar app for my email app. Maybe I do, I personally do, but you know, a lot of people don't. And so the idea of, of having to use separate apps for every single tool has gone away. These super apps have kind of built up. And frankly, people kind of realized, I think, regular users that you know, you might use an app a couple of times and then you never use it again. You know, it's great for a one-off, but there are very few apps that kind of stay with you that you use day after day after day. And that's a real problem um, if you're building an app business and, and if you're building apps because it's very different from how things were even just a few years ago. And as a result too, you know, like business models are evolving and changing as well. And so, you know, we, we saw kind of the shift away from direct sales, you know, direct purchase to, you know, in-app purchase. And now we're seeing you know, potentially the move to subscription businesses and ad-supported revenue models. And, and the models around how you charge for your apps and, and whether you make it freemium or not and, and how you make money for it is very different now than it was a few years ago. And, um, and it continues to evolve and, and, and it's going to continue to change. Um, the pricing argument still isn't quite settled. I think that's kind of the other thing where we are kind of in, in, in the end of 2016. You know, it would be easy to say no apps over X sell, except I know so many people in this room who were able to sell apps at a good price. Of course, that doesn't always scale. And, you know, the problem I think is, is, is with, with, with pricing um, is uh, we're still trying to kind of figure out 
how much people are willing to pay for apps. And I do think what's encouraging, you know, at, at the, the, the one big surprise of the iPhone event this year, because let's face it, there were no surprises. Mark Gurman told us everything. Like we knew everything about that phone. Um, we knew we weren't getting MacBooks, which was frustrating. We knew everything about the phone. But the one thing that we didn't know was, you know, Shigeru Miyamoto uh, from Nintendo coming up on stage and showing off Mario Run. And the thing that was exciting to me about that wasn't even so much, uh, you know, um, Mario Run, although I was excited. Um, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little bit afraid that the game's going to suck because it's an endless runner and I don't know how good it's going to be. I'm still going to buy it. I don't care how much it costs. But that's the point, right? He said, we're not going to be selling this with in-app purchase. We're going to be selling this with a direct price. And that becomes really interesting because even though just because it works for Nintendo doesn't mean it'll work for everybody else, this becomes an interesting time to potentially reset or at least realign consumer expectations for pricing. And Nintendo being willing to do this, assuming that they're willing to stay committed to this, and, and who knows, they could change, um, I think is an interesting sign that says some people are still willing to come out and be brand new to the App Store and say, we're willing to charge a fair price for our apps and not do in-app purchases and not do other ways of getting revenue, which I think consumers prefer, um, but obviously can be harder to monetize and harder to build a business. So I'm not, you know, a few months ago, I would have said the pricing question has been solved and, and most people are going to do better with subscriptions or with, with freemium in-app purchase. Uh, I think with Mario Run, that's going to be a really interesting thing to watch to see how successful it is and see if it can translate to things other than, other than games and, and high quality productivity apps. Um, the other kind of thing that I think a lot about, I kind of just say the app store is that there is an entire world outside of Apple that you've got to be aware of, right? And I, I know in this room and you know, kind of the point of this conference is that it's all about you know, building things for, for Apple and iOS, but that's not the only platform out there. And in fact, you know, Apple is in some ways losing market share. Um, Macs haven't been updated in years. <laughs> You know, I, I wrote a story a couple of weeks ago about how it feels like it's been 27 years since we got a new MacBook Pro, and I stand by that. And that is actually problematic. It's not just for people like me, and I think some of us in the, in, in the audience out here who are like, I really want a new MacBook Pro. The problem is for Apple is that if you are a regular user and you're going to the store and you have a couple, you know, you have money to spend on a laptop and you're comparing, you know, MacBook Pro versus something else on the market, um, it's really hard to make the argument, I think, today that the greatness of Mac OS aside, that the Mac is a great value. You used to always kind of be that um, you could make the argument, you could say, you know, a Mac is expensive, um, an iPhone is expensive, but if you compare what you're getting to what everybody else is, is selling, you're actually saving money or it's a very good value. That used to always be the argument with Macs. And when I wrote for, you know, uh, the unofficial Apple web blog, in, in uh, mid-aughts, that was, that was one of the things we would always kind of, you know, press in on. Um, honestly, that's not the case right now. And, and I think this is why I think I, I want a new MacBook Pro so badly. Um, if I compare a MacBook Pro that's running a three-year-old Haswell processor and an old GPU and an SSD with, with a certain screen and they want to charge me $2,000 versus, you know, a Windows machine for $2,000, which is going to be far better in every way and have more ports and a higher resolution screen and much faster processor and better battery life and all kinds of other things, that's hard to compare. Even worse, you know, there's a $1,000 or an $800 Windows machine that's going to be better equipped and have better specs than that $2,000 MacBook Pro. Even a MacBook Air, the most popular Mac, if you were going to compare a dollar to donuts versus, you know, a Chromebook or, I mean, nobody wants a Chromebook, but, you know, if, if you... <laughs> But if, if, if you compare it to, to a lower-end Windows machine, it's hard to make the argument for a regular person, for a college student, for the next generation, for people who are even already committed Mac users, it's hard to make the argument that they should stick with Apple. And that's one of the reasons, I think, not just the rise of Android, but the fact that Mac is kind of stagnated, is it's really important to be aware that there is a world outside of Apple that you have to be cognizant of. And I think what that means is when you're building apps, if it has a services component, frankly, it should have a web component because that way people can use it on other platforms. And, and we've seen, you know, Mac first and iOS first app developers keep that in mind. You know, 1Password famously was, was a Mac app and then it became an iOS app. I remember when the Android beta started and now, you know, they have the Windows version, now they're you know, moving to the cloud service. That's necessary. And, and I would argue that, that as much as I love 1Password and the guys at Agile Vids, they maybe waited a little bit too long to really make that shift because the rest of the world, especially for something as crucial as 
a uh, you know, password manager, you really need to use it on all your devices. And the modern world that we live in means that for a lot of people, including the people in this room, every device you have isn't necessarily going to be an Apple device. And if you've got any sort of service component to your app, any sort of thing that's syncing with the cloud, anything that's living outside of that world, you've got to be aware that those things exist. More than that, even when you're looking at you know, creating apps for things like you know, Facebook for, for iMessage, you've got to think about other platforms like Facebook Messenger, like Line, like Kick, uh, like WeChat. Um, I'll say this now, I think I'm going to get to this a uh, couple slides, but, but I'll just go ahead and preface this. If you're building you know, a, a sticker pack for, for iMessage, if you're not also putting those stickers on those other services, what are you doing? You're completely leaving money on the table. You've already got the assets. You've already got it done. Figure out how to submit them to other services. Facebook might not let you charge yet, but you can do a sampling. At least get them out there. Don't, you don't have to reduplicate your efforts. Get them everywhere. Don't think that you just have to be in the Apple e ecosystem, because not everybody has Apple. And if you can't, even if you can't profit off of it right now, doesn't mean you won't be able to in the future. Um, The good news is that Apple is paying attention. And I think that they're paying attention for the first time in a long time. Um, I, when I first started writing about apps in 2000, you know, for, for iOS, I've been writing about Mac apps, I guess, since 2007, but iOS apps, you know, 2008. The first few years of the App Store, you know, Apple really didn't do a lot of press outreach. I think they might have for the iPad. But other than bringing developers on stage, they really didn't do a lot to interface developers with the media. That's changed, and I think it's changed. Um, if I'm being cynical, it's changed because sales have decreased and because engagement with apps in the app stores has decreased, and so they need to kind of prove to developers and prove to people like you guys in this room that they're still the platform that you need to be investing your time and your money and your resources into. Um, and the less cynical part of me says that I think the company has just changed, and they understand that one of the things that made you know, Microsoft such a behemoth in the 90s was Steve Ballmer being sweaty on stage, screaming about developers, 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 developers. And so it is good to see that they are you know, paying attention and that they're doing things like, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, I don't really care, I didn't sign any NDA. They, they do these things where they'll, um, they'll get a bunch of people from the media together in a hotel suite and they'll have a bunch of app developers for a platform, you know, whether it's like tvOS or watchOS or the iPhone kind of show off and do kind of a showcase of what their apps are. And, 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 you know, you spend, as a reporter, about an hour and a half, and you look at these things, and maybe you get a little bit of news. And, and then, you know, they hope, that the hope is that, you know, at the end of that time, you'll write about at least a couple of the apps. And as a reporter, that's difficult, because for what I do, I can't always write about the apps. I've got to find the ones that are most mainstream. I might be able to use a roundup. But just the fact that they're doing that, the fact that they're, you know, doing briefings with, with, with press people about apps, is a big deal and is definitely encouraging that they know that there's a problem and they know that, as I mentioned earlier, the app you know, ecosystem is mature and that business models are changing. They're at least aware of that. Um, I think that's a good thing because a couple of years ago when I was writing that story about how you know, you know, paid apps aren't dead but they're on life support, they definitely weren't. They definitely, if they did know about it, they were still touting the, the company line that everything was fine and really weren't doing, at least from, from my perspective, from developers that I talked to, a lot of outreach to try to get you know, developers more eyeballs and more attention. I do want to say kind of my final kind of, you know, like with the state of like the app store is I've been a little bit negative, but I fundamentally don't believe that apps are dead. But the boom is probably over, at least for now. Uh, that doesn't mean it'll stay over, but it is probably over for now. I think that you know, the iPhone 7 Plus and the new camera system, if, you, if you've got any sort of app with photography, this does actually finally open up some really interesting possibilities. Um, the new platforms might not be taking off the way that we thought we, that they would, but they still offer, offer some new possibilities. And, you know, when the next big thing happens with technology, whether it's with, with AI or talking, uh, you know, to, to stuff, I mean, I think that, that Siri, assuming they can get Siri to actually not be terrible, um, you know, working correctly, that opens up possibilities because I think talking to your devices, whether it's your AirPods in your ear or talking to your phone or talking to your watch, becomes really interesting and can probably open up the door for people to care about apps again. I just kind of wanted to, you know, spend a little more time with just kind of things I've observed about apps and about kind of the, the business, I guess, that all you guys are in kind of as a tech reporter. Um, number one, app discovery is still a shit show. I know I just said, you know, that Apple cares. 
they do care, but their approach to fixing app discovery so far has been pretty terrible. Right now, I think that it's about you know what buying paid keywords, and 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 they are doing some things as far as calling the app store from apps that haven't been updated in years, and meaning you can't spam, um, you know, titles with with you know more than twenty seven characters. So you can't stuff your title and say you know Hulu, stream TV, and t and movies, and this, and that, and cartoons, and kids, and family. That was literally like Hulu's description until September 1st or, 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 or whenever they put the, the new uh, naming rules into effect. Hulu's, I think, character description was 92 characters long. That's Hulu. That, to me, says everything you need to know right there about how app discovery still should show when Hulu, one of the most popular video apps, is having to resort to those tactics. Well, what about everybody else? So app discovery is still a shit show, and I don't know when it's going to improve. Um, I think that Apple is listening but I don't know if they're willing to do right now everything that needs to be done to make it better. And short of a full overhaul, I don't know what can happen. Uh, I guess the encouraging, slightly, eh, maybe depressing, I don't know. The, this, the, the, the slightly depressing news, I guess, or, or maybe encouraging news, is that it's, it's not like it's any worse on iOS than it is on any other platform, right? Like, it's, it's, it's a shit show on Android and, and on Windows, oof, uh, too. So, apps discovery is a shit show. Um, the other things I've observed as a tech reporter, and this is this is true now, and this didn't used to always be true, but I have to, uh, to kind of go back about why I probably won't write about your app. You can't rely on blogs to sell your app. You know, in the old days when the app ecosystem was not mature and when it was still growing, it was a novelty, and you could write about this really great app. And there are still blogs and websites that'll do great stories. You know, sites like 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 Mac Stories and iMore will do really good stuff on apps. Everybody else is probably going to do roundups be more servicey and about you know X apps for this. And if your app can get listed in that sort of list, that's awesome. But unless you're a Prisma or a Pokemon Go or some sort of weird hit app, the fact of the matter is, as much as I might find it interesting, my audience doesn't care. And I know that's depressing to hear, but it's the truth. And I think that because the old way of app marketing used to be so much about getting write-ups on TechCrunch or Mashable or, or wherever, um, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, A, you can't rely on those places to write about you, and B, even if you can, that's not going to sell your app or get you downloads because there's so much news and there's so many other things happening. And because app fatigue is real, most users don't care. What they care about is when they need to do something, and that's when it comes down to the discovery problem, which, as I said, is a shit show. But that's where there is an opportunity as well to, to spread the word about how people can find your app and, and figure out other ways that aren't related to just, please write a news blurb about my app. Because the fact of the matter is, most people don't care. Um, that isn't to say that you can't have success if, if you're doing roundups. I did a big story for Mashable. It was a kind of a servicey post. Apple was not happy with it, called um, Apple's stock app stuck. Replace them with these instead. They, 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 they fun story. They, they called me, and they were like, um, can you change the headline? I was like, sure can't. Sure can't. Um, I, I appreciate your call. Um, the headline is not going away. Um, and I, but I basically came up with an alternative for every stock app. And um, a couple of uh, the developers in this room, I think your apps were on my list. And so I appreciate that. And uh, everybody should download those instead. Um, and, and I, but, I, but again, I don't even know if that was successful in driving traffic to any of those things. I know the story did really well. And I know that we, the Mashable, uh, you know, repurposed on Snapchat for like a long time. Uh, but I don't know if that really had any, you know, cognitive, you know, impact on downloads or not. I hope that it did, but if I'm being honest and, and just looking at, you know, how trends have changed over time, it, it probably hasn't as much. Um, and that's why I think that agility is of utmost importance, especially when you're building a business uh, based on, on apps. Because, again, like me, who works in media where, you know, things can change at the, you know, spur of a moment, whether, you know, all of a sudden you, you were going all in on, on, on hard news, and then you realize no one was clicking your, your, to read about your Syrian refugee crisis coverage. So it's back to Game of Thrones all the time. Um, and that's what happened to Mashable. Mashable had gone really all in on, on, on certain type of content and then it didn't work and had to pivot. Um, being agile and figuring out what works and what doesn't is really important. Understanding that I put this time, even if, it's, even if it means abandoning the platform, even if it means I spent all this time on this WashOS app, but no one's using it, and it's taking more resources away from me, and it's not the right fit for what I'm doing, making the decision to drop it and say, 
you know, focus on an iMessage app instead or focus on, you know, adding aspects to my other app that are, is better or focus on a web component. Being agile is really important. Being what's working and what's not and not being afraid of pivot. Um, the other thing, and this is, this is a sad one, but, you know, the, the best app doesn't always or even often win. And that's the truth. You know, the, I wouldn't go as far as to say the best marketing wins because that's not necessarily true either. Um, but the best app doesn't always win. And so it's kind of a combination, I think, of being smart, being early, um, aggressively getting your, op your optimization correctly, and you know, focusing on getting a good product out. But the best product doesn't always win. I mean, I think we can all think in our minds, we all know apps that we've loved, that we've seen go away. Um, you know, the Vesper is, is, I think, a good example. First of all, I wouldn't say that that was the best app, although it was a very good app. But, but I wouldn't say it was the best, just, just candidly. And, and I, I, you know, I, I know Dave real well, and, and, and I, I know John a little bit, and I've always respected you know, uh, Prince, so I don't want to say anything to disparage Vesper, but I think that that's right there, a really good example, that you can have a dream team that on paper should be great. You, know, you have a permanent link to your app on one of the most visited Apple sites on the web. And if that can't make it work, a, that doesn't mean everybody else is screwed, because that's not what I'm saying. But it means you can't rely just on that. It means you've got to do a little bit more, and that simply having a good app isn't enough. Because if it was, there'd be a lot of apps and a lot of people, and I know people in this room who've built things that haven't worked out, that would still be around. But I've also learned, though, kind of related to that, is that you know, gimmicks don't scale, but that doesn't mean you can discount them. You know, Smule is a company that I remember talking with them when they did an app called IMT Pain, where they, uh, which was, a, which was a, do you guys remember that app? IMT Pain was a great app, okay? It was fantastic. It was a really good app. You basically you'd talk into it and it would turn your voice into T Pain. It was on the Auto Tune app. It was a really good app. They also created the Ocarina app. Actually, that's when I first met them, it was the Ocarina app. Total gimmick, right? But it was one of the first app store apps that really, like, you blow into the, the bottom and you would, like, play this flute. Genius idea. Then they did IMT Pain in partnership with someone, and then they created you know, um, you know, Magic Piano, and they've gone on to do some other apps. A lot of their stuff are kind of gimmicky, to be honest. But if you look at the top grossing apps right now in the App Store, uh, like uh, Magic Karaoke, or whatever the hell they call it, is way up there. And I don't know how they do it, but they've got, I guess, a really big contention of people who use it in, in Asia, and they've built a kind of big social network around it. And it's a gimmick, and, and it doesn't scale because it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of upkeep, that doesn't mean you can discount it. And so this isn't to say you should like, you know, build apps solely based on gimmicks, but I think that it's worth noting that if you do have that feature that can kind of get somebody's attention, especially when it's so hard, when we all have app fatigue and we all have malaise happening, it's worthwhile to think about, is there something gimmicky happening? Because when you do, people tend to pay more attention to it, whether it's having you know, uh, you know, an iMessage component where you can collaborate on documents together or, you know, uh, to, to, to chat with or sort of some bot functionality that, that you're building into some other apps or, or you know, shortcuts and, and um, shortcuts, I guess, uh, extensions that you're using other places. If you can do that sort of thing, you know, cool, cool widgets, why not? If you can spare the resources and if it's not going to take away from your core competencies, it might actually wind up being successful. So, again, I could have close out, but, you know, kind of trends that I see kind of looking ahead. Um, the first and, and foremost one, I think, is that you know, the subscriptions are probably the future for non-premium apps. I don't have data to back this up. This is just my gut. Uh, we've seen this with traditional box software, where everybody has kind of moved to the subscription model. You know, Adobe is having their best quarters ever. You know, Adobe is making more money than ever before, and people, including me, are paying like $50 a month for Creative Cloud, even though I use one app. I should really downgrade my subscription, but that takes time and effort. and. Uh, you know, they're making money hand over fist. Microsoft, who, you know, was a company that was making, you know, a lot of their money, so they still make a lot of the money selling licenses of Windows, have moved from selling licenses of Office to selling subscriptions of Office. And um, I think that it'll be interesting to see what happens in the App Store. I'm cautiously optimistic just because we saw how poorly subscriptions worked in newsstand. Um, but I think that this is probably going to be the solution for a lot of non-premium apps where you have a base app that will do maybe certain things or maybe not do certain things, and you pay a monthly or a yearly fee. I think yearly subscriptions have a really good opportunity to do well, because I think a lot of people, if they're going to use the app more than once, might pay $5 or $6 for it. And you know, I know this is probably anti-consumer for me to say, but it's true. People forget that they've subscribed to stuff. So you continue to renew over and over again. I was looking through my app store subscriptions 
I still subscribe to a 48 hours app that CBS put out for the iPad like years ago, where I think it was like $2 a month. I don't even know what it is. It, it's, it's not insignificant is all I know, but I get charged yearly to get access you know, to like episodes of 48 hours. The app hasn't been updated since 2011. But I'm still getting charged for that, and because I'm stupid and I, I don't care, it's like AOL, right? Like Verizon spent like $4 billion on AOL, and the joke was always like every quarter, they're like, they're still making this much money from their uh, you know, dial-up business. And I tried five years ago, yeah, five years ago, I tried to find an AOL dial-up subscriber, could not do it, actually ended up finding a couple, um, and then the week that the story was going to go to print, they were like in their 80s. They were they were um, um, they immigrated from from Russia. They were Holocaust survivors, and they had dial up, and they didn't feel like they needed anything else. And then they learned that on YouTube they could watch old Russian radio shows. And suddenly they realized, oh, actually, you know what, that Comcast thing? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do that. And so it totally blew my story because I was like, I had I had I had the the AOL dial up couple, and I couldn't find them. So subscriptions, I mean, you know, for better or worse, people forget to unsubscribe. Yes, people's credit cards change. But if you have them kind of renewing and if people keep their content updated in iTunes, it's, I mean, it's not a bad hustle, potentially. <laughs> uh, I would also say kind of looking ahead that uh, the iPad Pro, I think, is a really interesting device because I do think that it presents a unique opportunity for pricing and for subscriptions. Because although I do wish that Apple would let developers just build apps for the iPad Pro, and not for anything else. Um, I, I say that as an iPad Pro user, and I think that that would be better for developers too. I think that the way they're positioning the device as a true kind of laptop replacement, as your you know um, Chromebook for people who you know have means, um, I think that that means that there's opportunities for apps to do a lot more. Because I've been very impressed with a lot of iPad apps that are that are built with the iPad Pro in mind, and I think that subscriptions and even charging more for the apps or something you can do because well, people will understand the inherent value of this is more like a desktop app. And, and the one thing we, you know, I'm talking mostly about iOS stuff, but we haven't seen as much of a, a downturn in pricing on Macs. And I think that's because developers were smart enough to kind of hold strong when, that, when the Mac App Store launched and, and kind of not have that race to the bottom, probably because that ecosystem had existed longer. And for whatever reason, consumers feel like there's more value in a Mac app than an iOS app. This is absolutely not true. But it makes it, you know, even me, someone who spends a lot of money on apps and loves to support developers, I, you know, won't think twice about spending $10 or $20 on a Mac app. But if somebody wants me to spend $10 on an iOS app, I'm like, what? Uh, no. Um, but I think the iPad Pro has the potential to change that. I message apps and sticker packs are fads. They are fads that you should be monetizing. You should be like capitalizing on like right now. Like if you have any art skills, if you have anything in your you know your, your repository, anything you can do to sell in your clients, they can take advantage of these things. Shit, strike while the iron is hot. But like I said, don't just do it for 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 buy message. You know, if you've got those assets, approach Kick, approach Line, look at WeChat, get into Facebook Messenger, even if they're not going to pay you right now. Use those resources. Don't don't just do it one and done because these things are. There's a real money maker. Line is a, 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 a Japanese company, um, or I think they're Japanese. Um, most of their user base is in Japan anyway. They went public a few months ago, and it was the first real tech IPO of, of 2016, I think, other than uh, other than Twilio, and they did very well. Almost all their money comes from freaking stickers. So literally a company went public and sells hundreds of millions of dollars a year in stickers. And this is for an app that is basically only used in five countries. Imagine when you talk about, you know, billions of people using an ecosystem. So if you're not on it, I mean, look, not all of, I'm not going to try to say like chase trends and whatnot, but in this case, yeah, I mean, like maybe like chase a trend. Um, I would also say kind of looking ahead, the Apple Watch those apps and, and the, the platform for that are, are really foremost about health, health and fitness. And that's it. If you want to build a component, if it's not going to take a lot of your time, fine. Complications can be cool, awesome. But, for, I mean, but honestly, even the way Apple's positioning the device, they know that the main reason people are buying it right now is as a health and fitness device. I really enjoy my modern buckle, you know, $250 band. Um, I enjoy the fashion aspect, but I don't use Apple Watch apps. A, they're slow. Uh, B, it takes too long sometimes, even when they're not slow to, to load up and, and, and see, you know, just the, the use case hasn't quite been there yet. 
But we, where the use case does exist is with health and fitness, and especially now that watchOS 3 lets uh, developers take full advantage of the APIs and the processor and on the Series 2s, the GPS and, and, and that sort of thing. If you've got apps that plug into those things, there is actually an opportunity, and I think a paid opportunity, for people to do that. Because one of the categories of apps that hasn't, you know, people are still willing, willing to pay for, especially on a subscription basis, are fitness apps. You know, RunKeeper and, and apps like that. RunKeeper Pro does a lot of money, and they're a big company, and a lot of people pay, you know, $5, $2, whatever it is a month for, for more features and for more offerings. And a lot of exercise apps make a lot of money charging recurring revenue to get new exercises delivered every day. And if you have an Apple Watch component that'll also measure, you know, take, you know, everything you're doing in that app and apply it to your circles, I mean, that's a potential win. Um, and I think, you know, the final thing, and I kind of mentioned, alluded to this earlier, you know, it's a dirty word. It's like what SEO used to be like in my business, which is gross, but it's reality. You know, app store optimization is going to matter more than ever before because, as I said, discovery is a shit show. So when discovery is a shit show, you have to work around whatever means there are, whether that means, you know, optimizing the number of characters that you're using in your descriptions, whether it means buying keywords as part of the Apple search stuff, whether it means, you know, finding other ways on, um, you know, social media to, to promote your apps. The future of app discovery is, I think, social media, not glitzy launches. Um, unless you've got a really big budget and you've got like a partner like, you know, a Nintendo, you know, for Pokemon Go of the world. The reality is, is doing a really glitzy launch and having all the tech sites cover your app, it's probably not going to pay off. It might have some stuff, but it's not going to pay off as much as doing, you know, um, buying podcast ads, uh, doing uh, sales on YouTube, making, you know, doing Instagram ads, frankly, I think is smarter. I've actually think, I think I've seen, I've myself passed through more times recently on like Instagram app ads or even stuff that I know is like a ripoff, like stupid, like match three games. I'm like, what are you doing? Like I would never click on this ad in any other context, but it actually works if I'm already in my feed. So I think that honestly, the future of app discovery and those sorts of things is going to increasingly be about social media. Snapchat, I think is a great opportunity, especially once they start to allow people to kind of go into other places. Um, there's, uh, there, there are other apps where you can do, you know, app, you know, ads basically. I think that this sort of thing is really gonna be more the future about getting stuff seen and because they have more return on investment, better KPIs, whatever that means, um, than, uh, than just doing a glitzy launch and trying to get, you know, people like me to write about your app. Because uh, A, like I said, I'm probably not gonna write about it, sorry. Uh, and B, um, I think, you know, you wind up getting better, better investment uh, for your buck. Um, so I'm out of time, but I did want to stop and just kind of go back to what I was saying before about how, you know, taking the, the risk and making the decision not to take that job out of fear wound up being a really good thing. So the job that I talked about before where the, the, if I'd taken it, it would have been fear-based, um, even though it was a little bit less money. Um, the really good thing I didn't take that job because uh, they laid off 40% of their staff a week and a half ago. And uh, I most certainly would have lost my job. There's no question in my mind. Uh, I, it's an absolute guarantee that I would have lost my job. Unfortunately, my husband, who's a developer, was, uh, he was also not super lucky. And uh, so uh, this is just my being stupid and silly and, and uh, taking advantage of the fact that I have a captive developer audience. If, uh, if you know anyone who's hiring for, for Django, Python, <laughs> LCSS, uh, SCSS, or uh, uh, NoSQL, uh, grantee.co, pass it on. And uh, thank you so much.